Hi, my name is Jeff. Welcome to Rainier View Christian Church. We are continuing our series today on the royals. We want to do a series looking at some of the ancient kings of Israel recorded in some of the Old Testament books of the Bible and see what wisdom can we learn in our own lives from their examples, both good and bad. And then also, what do we do with this misplaced hope that we often put on our leaders who fail us? How do we process that better? And so we decided to do the series on the royals. And now, in the United States, we don't have royalty. Sure, there's some celebrities that maybe people follow as pseudo-royalty, but the closest thing we have in the United States to royalty is the United States presidency, okay? Uh, and so, Way back uh, a few years ago, I decided to start reading one presidential biography, at least one presidential biography, in chronological order as a way to just explore U.S. history. I know, super nerdy, uh, but for me, there are these fascinating insights that, uh, that I've learned as a result of reading U.S. history this way. One of those being, there are often some unexpected things that happen when a president dies in office, either from uh, you know, illness or disease or from assassination. Uh, and so one example of that is what happens in the assassination of James A. Garfield back in what I call the weird beard period of United States president's history, post Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and so uh, Candace Millard in her book, uh, The Destiny of the Republic, she tells the story of the assassination of James A. Garfield. Now, not this Garfield, the one who's orange with black stripes, who loves lasagna and hates Mondays, not that Garfield, this Garfield, James A. Garfield. And the assassin, Charles Guiteau, uh, believes that he heard from God, and it was God's plan and purpose that he wanted him to assassinate Garfield to purify the political party. And so he takes action. He does this more on Guiteau later. Uh, but Garfield actually doesn't die from Guiteau's uh, assassination. He actually dies from poor medical practice at the time that rejected these newfangled ideas like sterilization of instruments or doctors washing their hands before they poke their fingers into open bullet wounds to try and find the bullet. Yeah, just be grateful you live now, not then. Um, but nobody at this time wanted to see James Garfield make it through the presidency alive than his vice president, Chester A. Arthur. Again, weird beard period, check out these mutton chops. I don't know like functionally what he was going for, but they are impressive. Now, Arthur was a spoil system advocate through and through. At this time, you doled out government offices, government jobs, and you did so to make sure that people would not only vote for you, but they would encourage other people to vote for you. It's how you wielded political power uh, in the post-Civil War era, in particular in the United States at the time. And so it was expected that, that uh, Chester A. Arthur, who was the king of the spoil system, would just double down on it. It would make more corruption. It would, it would you know, make things even worse for the country upon becoming president. But what's fascinating is that when James A. Garfield does die and Chester A. Arthur takes his place, that he actually does the opposite. He begins actively dismantling this spoil system that benefited him so much. It's under Arthur's presidency that the Pendleton Act is passed, which moved government jobs and offices away from being doled out as political favors to being based upon merit, the best man for the job. Sorry, ladies, it's 1800s United States still, okay? So just, they're just handing out jobs to the dudes. Uh, but... In that assassination attempt, right, something unexpected happens. And we're going to look at the story of a king of ancient Israel, and his name is Josiah, and something that unexpected happens upon him becoming king of Israel following an assassination attempt. And Josiah has to step into a situation that required much greater courage, much bigger problems than the problems that Chester A. Arthur inherited when he became president. Um, but it reminds us that we all have a power, as we look at the life of Josiah, we'll be reminded that we all have the power to have courage to face the problems ahead of us. And so these were bleak times for the people of the southern kingdom of Israel. It's known as Judah in the Bible. When you look in your Old Testament, as we, as we call it in our Bible, um, that 
the kingdom of Judah, it's, it's hard times. Uh, we, we see people struggling uh, to make wise decisions and to live rightly. And so just here's the backdrop of what Josiah inherits. Okay? His grandfather, Manasseh, is known uh, as, as bloody Manasseh sometimes when we look at the book of 2 Kings. Look at this colorful detail that describes his grandfather's reign. 2 Kings chapter 21. Moreover, Manasseh sh- also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit so that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This tells us the kind of leader Manasseh is and that he's not a good one. It is not good times. And so Manasseh's son, Ammon, takes over from him at the age of 22. And Ammon is assassinated two years into his reign. Uh, The people around him have had enough. The people of Israel have had enough. They round up the assassins and execute them. And so into this leadership vacuum, into this mess, enter Josiah. An eight-year-old boy is coronated king of Judah. And this leads to something completely unexpected happening as his rule and reign gets underway. Because during Josiah's reign, somebody in the temple, the temple being the focal point of God's presence, the symbol of him being with his people, establishing his kingdom, they're sitting around this, this low, dark moment in the history of ancient Israel. And somebody's like, hey, what's that, what's that scroll in the corner over there in the temple? And another person's like, oh, that? Uh, that's just the, the covenant that our ancestors made with God, that if we do the things that God asks of us, everything will go well for us and we'll be blessed. If we don't do those things, uh, then we'll, things will not go well. We'll experience curses. And Josiah is like, what? This has been sitting here the whole time. And let's read what he discovers and the action that Josiah takes because of it. uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, beginning at the top. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. And so what happens here is that somebody either discovers the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, or they just discover uh, the book of Deuteronomy. It's on a scroll back then. Uh, And I love this story because Josiah starts with what's been revealed to him, okay? He's not worried about more, understanding more things, okay? It teaches us that you and I can respond to what God has already revealed to us rather than worrying about the things that we don't yet understand. I love this quote attributed to Mark Twain. It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. So meaning, you don't have to worry so much about the parts of the Bible here that that don't make sense to you yet, or maybe never will. But you can focus on what you do know, even if what it asks of you is a high cost, even if the problems seem insurmountable in your life right now. For example, you could be like, I don't understand anything in the book of Revelation, right? There's scrolls, there's trumpets, and the scrolls, seals are being opened, and there's flying scorpions, and what, like, what's going on? And you might have a lot of questions about that, but any and all of us can understand the clear teachings of Jesus, for instance, that are captured in the gospels like these. Jesus says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Or another place, love your neighbor as yourself. See, the people in Josiah's day had forgotten about pursuing God. They were choosing to live their own way, to worship whatever they wanted to, and it was not going well for them. And so the the passage in 2 Kings chapter 23 goes on to outline just how dark, just how bleak, just how bad things had gotten for the people during Josiah's reign. The passage goes on to say, that he, Josiah, took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. 
He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord, the quarters where the women did the weaving for Asherah. Can catch how bad things got. The temple, though supposed to be this pure place of worship and representing God's presence with his people, has been turned into a spiritualized frat house uh, where prostitution is engaged in, where people are trying to uh, engage all these sex acts and make these offerings to conjure up powers to try and bring blessing into their life. This is what's happening in the temple itself. Things are not looking good for Josiah here. But I also am so encouraged by passages like this because God can turn around the bleakest and darkest of situations. He can work in the most defeated moments of our lives, just like he works in and through Josiah here. Because Josiah models this biblical example of courageousness. He had the courage to say, what's going on under my rule and my house is not right. We've got to take some action to change things, to get back to renewing the covenant with God, living the way that God invites us to. And that type of courage doesn't show up just in good intentions, doesn't show up in introspection. It shows up in a commitment to take action. That doesn't lead to immediate transformation, by the way. If you see immediate change in somebody's life, it often is either hype or fake, okay? Real transformation is taking one step of faithfulness to follow God, followed by another, by another, by another, by another. This is what true life transformation and discipleship is really all about. But if Josiah could act in the face of such widespread, incredibly difficult problems, with only a sliver of the Bible that you and I have uh, in our hands today— then clearly you and I can have the courage to step into some of the difficult situations and problems that you and I are facing right now. Now, I want to look at a piece of the narrative that's kind of an example. Again, these are flyovers of the big picture of these lives. We're not going to be able to get into all the details, but I want to read one representative example of what Josiah does to take action and to bring change. In 2 Kings uh, 23, verse 12, says, he pulled down the altars of the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz. And the altars of Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces, and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem or on the south of the hill of corruption. The one Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the site with human bones. Now, Josiah acts based upon what he heard. He heard the covenant and he acts accordingly. And this pattern of acting upon what we hear is echoed hundreds of years later by James, the brother of Jesus. In James' letter to the churches, in chapter 1, verse 22, we read this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And Josiah doesn't pick and choose what feels right for him, what he likes. He follows wholeheartedly. And that wholehearted pursuit, right, the example of the change that transforms uh, Josiah's society and the kingdom around him, as we'll continue to read, right, should be a reminder that we're never too old, we're never too young, we're never too far gone, we're never too whatever for God to work, for God to bring change and transformation. But that transformation doesn't come through half measures. It comes through a wholehearted, full pursuit of it. Okay? There's a reason that we used to call uh, you know, the different various religious faiths faith systems. Because a faith system is meant to be practiced holistically. It's supposed to speak to every facet, every aspect of your life. And when you embrace the Christian faith, it, it speaks to your whole life in a holistic and complete way. Because in our world, it's far too often where we encounter this idea of religion being kind of a pick-and-choose buffet, that we just kind of mix and match everything. And the reality is doing that has not led us 
to the kind of life that we want to have. It hasn't really led to a deeper, more abiding sense of peace or a a lasting sense of joy or a deep resonant hope in our lives because we're kind of just picking and choosing. Josiah holistically embraces this. And when you embrace the Christian faith holistically, here's one of the things that happens. You come to know the depth of God's love for you. The, the extent to which he has chased you down to know you, to redeem you, to forgive you. And when you come to know that, you have a deeper sense of your worth than you ever could otherwise. But that comes through embracing faith wholeheartedly and pursuing it. And when you do, you have the power, like Josiah, to make a difference where God has placed you and to pursue the things that he's called you to do right where you are. And so for Josiah, that begins with radically removing all these altars of false worship all around the temple and even within the temple itself to the point that he digs up human bones, he grinds them into bone powder, and he sprinkles them all over the place. And you're like, what? (laughs) What is that all about? Okay, in his culture, this would have been the ultimate way of defiling those spaces, that by, by pouring out dead man's bones, basically, on these worship sites, it's ensuring that no one would ever come back and worship there again. No one would try and set up a, an altar to a false god there again. He's ensuring uh, that they've broken with that past. He's taken action and steps to do it. And so what about the lesson for you and I? What can we learn, again, from Josiah here in this moment? Well, I think it poses really a question. The question of, What lengths are you willing to go to avoid sliding back into patterns of behavior that are harmful or destructive or keep you from thriving the way that God wants you to? What are you willing to do to ensure that you don't slide back into those actions, okay? I've known guys who have have done something similar to what Josiah has done. When they've struggled with viewing pornography online or inappropriate material online, Right? They've said, hey, I've installed an app. It's going to send you every website I visit and flag ones that look suspicious or not good for me. And when that happens, I need you to check me. Right? I've known guys who have gone so far as to remove internet access from their home, uh, from their phones, to ensure that they don't fall into that trap. I think the lesson that Josiah gives us here is really a question that asks, how far are we willing to go to wholeheartedly pursue God and the good things that he has for us? And so step into the change that you need to make, because as we're going to see here, as we continue to read in the passage, it has a profound effect, not just upon Josiah's life, but upon the whole kingdom of Judah here. There's a deep and abiding joy that we get to participate in when we pursue God wholeheartedly together. Look what it says uh, further down in chapter 23, picking back up in verse 21. It says, The king gave this order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. Neither in the days of the judges who led Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and the spiritists, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. He, uh, this he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book of Hilkiah, that Hilkiah the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him, who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Now this Passover event that's described here that Josiah, uh, you know, unrolls over the entire kingdom here was the most important event of the year for the people of Israel. This annual practice was to be done to remind the people not only of what God had done in freeing them from slavery in Egypt, but it was also a once-a-year time to be reminded of the the covenant that God's people were supposed to make with him. It was, in in essence, each year there was an annual re-upping of the subscription to pursue Yahweh wholeheartedly, and the people of ancient Israel were supposed to do this. 
And that it was such a momentous occasion speaks to the fact of how out of, out of vogue that it had become, how weakly it had been celebrated. Now, throughout the entirety of ancient Israel, of course, people were celebrating the Passover in their homes, in smaller pockets. But a celebration like this, a kingdom-wide celebration, hadn't been seen for generations and generations, okay? But because the return to pursuing God had been so great, the celebration was as equally grand that Josiah gets to lead the people into. Josiah here is the epitome of courageousness in the face of difficult circumstances, of choosing to act in accordance with what he knew to believe as true and good, rather than to give in to the temptations and the pressures that others were inviting him to in the world around him. But the end of Josiah's life gives us a cautionary piece of wisdom that there's a fine line between being courageous and being reckless. There's a fine line between courage and recklessness. And so let's read more about this chapter in Josiah's life and leadership in the companion book to, to 2 Kings, which is 2 Chronicles. It just gives a different perspective on this era of ancient Israel's history. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 35, beginning verse 20. After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, Necho king of Egypt went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah marched out to meet him in battle. But Necho sent messengers to him saying, what quarrel is there, king of Judah, between you and me? Is it not you I am attacking, at, or it is not you I'm attacking at this time, but the house with which I am at war? God has told me to hurry, so stop opposing God, who is with me, or he will destroy you. However, Josiah, however, would not turn away from him, but disguised himself to engage in battle. He would not listen to what Necho had said at God's command, but went to fight him on the plain of Megiddo. Archers shot King Josiah, and he told his officers, take me away, I'm badly wounded. So they took him out of his chariot, put him in his other chariot, and brought him to Jerusalem where he died. He was buried in the tombs of his ancestors, and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. And so in this final chapter, of Josiah's life, we see the sobering reality that there is a line between being courage, having courage and being courageous and being reckless. And so without getting into all the details, because that's not the point of this series, um, what's going on here is really Josiah overextends himself. This is really the core of this. And so this is probably something that actually doesn't affect the majority of people of faith. For the majority of people who call themselves Christians, we actually need to lean in a little bit harder to pursuing God and wholeheartedly pursuing our faith in our life, okay? But for some of us, we can take on too much, right? We want to see so many great things happen, and we're so burdened, and we're trying to chase after all of them, and we end up getting burnt out. And then it's so easy to end up in a place of bitterness or cynicism because all the things that we thought God would do, he's not doing. And so we don't know what to do with that. And it all stems from the same problem that Josiah had of grasping for bigger and better, grasping for more, rather than being focused on making the difference that God invited him to. Because what was that difference? That difference was to lead the people of Israel back to a wholehearted pursuit of him. Okay, that was Josiah's calling. That was what he's supposed to do. But Josiah takes his eye off of that and he moves it on these two superpowers at the time, Assyria and Babylon. Okay, and so the Assyrians and the Egyptians, they, they kind of teamed up and they were going to kind of take on uh, Babylon. And Josiah thinks, you know what? We're going to get run over by all these guys. And so I'm going to pick a side. I'm going to try and, and go against Assyria here. Uh, to kind of prove myself to the Babylonians that, uh, that they should kind of keep us in mind. And so here's the, here's the reality. Were the Assyrians and the Babylonian empires that are, that are warring and Josiah's trying to protect his people in, like, were they oppressive empires? Yes. Should he have been concerned for the security of his people? Yes. Did God want him to go out and, and choose to fight them in battle? Clearly the answer here is no. That is not what Josiah was called to do that he had a clear calling, but he takes his eyes off of it. 
And that overextending, reaching for more beyond what he was called to do, actually ends his life. Now, you overextending yourself probably isn't going to lead uh, to an untimely death by an archer. But it will take years of your health off your life. It will rob you of the satisfaction and contentment if you don't learn to rest and trust in what God has for you right now and the step that you're on. What is God calling you to do right now and to be focused on that no more and no less? This is part of knowing that line between what it means to be courageous and what is just simply reckless. And how's the, what's the best way to understand what side of the line you're on? It's to be in community with others. Be in community with others. Let's go back to the top. Remember, we talked at the beginning about the assassination of uh, James Garfield and then his replacement, the Vice President Chester A. Arthur, with the impressive mutton chop and sideburns. But let's return to that assassin, Charles Guiteau, uh, because Guiteau believed that he had heard from God, that God had told him that he was supposed to assassinate Garfield to purify his political party and to ensconce uh, himself, Guiteau, as, as a key member of the party. And so Guiteau believes he hears from God directly. Now, yes, historically we know there were clearly mental health uh, issues going on for Guiteau but he compounds the problems that he has because of two factors. He never learns to relate well with others in community at any point in his life, and he pursues his faith in isolation, alone, that is just he and God, and he's just just listening, and there's no outside influence around that. And so he believes that he is the answer, that his his, uh, disappointment with his political party is causing him to take violent action, and he believes God is sanctioning this. And so while Guiteau's response is extreme, uh, in our world today, we see people increasingly taking more and more extreme measures because of their dissatisfaction. And so what can we learn from Josiah here that can help us with that? When we are dissatisfied with our human leaders, how do we not give in to extreme responses or even just giving up altogether? Well, Josiah reminds us of this. For the majority of his life, Josiah bases his life and leadership on something outside of himself rather than what's within himself. He bases his life and leadership on something outside of himself rather than what's within himself. For example, if you go back to uh, a chapter in 2 Chronicles 34, Josiah heeds the instruction of Huldah the prophetess when he's like, I'm not sure what to do, or how, do, how am I going to lead the people? And he heeds the wisdom, the counsel, the instruction of others outside of himself in combination with God's word. And it goes well for him. But then one chapter later, we see Josiah pursuing a reckless course of action. He doesn't consult anybody. In fact, the, the pagan king Necho is like, bro, if you go down this road, it's going to end poorly for you. I, you should stop, right? And he doesn't heed any of it, Okay. And so for us today, but especially for Christians, okay, anytime we isolate ourselves, anytime we cut ourselves off from a church community, and we just think all I need is just God and I, it's just me, it's it's my personal faith, right? We end up in a place where what we hear is often self-centered. What we hear often doesn't lead us to help others. Often that that isolating faith is just me and God, I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do leads to more dysfunction, leads to more relational pain and hurt. It leads to a fixation on things like deep study of the end times rather than a life that is committed to being the light of the world, than committing to be like Jesus to the people around me, right? It's when the book of the law is discovered that Josiah has this outside revelation of who God is. And that change comes for both Josiah and all the people around him. Now, yes, God's Holy Spirit does speak to us individually as well as corporately. But when we're trying to hear from God, when we're trying to listen to God's Spirit, we need to remember first and foremost that we always need to do that in community with others and in conjunction with reading God's Word faithfully and in its original context. And so if our actions, right, here's a, here's a real clear litmus test. If your actions that you believe God is leading you to are leading to less 
of the fruit of the Spirit that we read of in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things, if it's leading to less of that in your life or the lives of others, God's not leading you in that direction. You need to, you need to pause before taking some more steps. Because what I've seen too many people in the church do, too many Christians do, is use the God card to just go ahead and do whatever selfish thing that they want to do. Okay? Well, God told me, right? Once you say the words, God told me, it's the end of heeding wisdom. The discussion is closed. There's no more arguing, right? Well, if God told you, I, okay, I guess go do it. But here's the problem. Often, it doesn't lead us into a life that looks more like Jesus. We use that as an excuse to do the things that our wicked, sinful hearts want to do, okay? And so instead, if you're actively trying to follow Jesus right now, here's what I would suggest. Instead of saying, God told me, because you want to yield to the leading of the Spirit. What if you said something like this instead? As I've been in community with others, sitting down with a friend across the table, hey, as I've been in community with others, as I've been trying to read and understand uh, God's word clearly, now I'm sensing that God might be leading you to, and fill in the blank. Hey, what do you think about that? Or even you're sitting down and you say, hey, as, as I'm trying to understand God's word and, and put these clear teachings into practice in my life, I'm, I'm in community with others, I've been praying, I'm kind of sensing God leading me maybe to, again, fill in the blank. What do you think? Right, you notice the difference between those two things. By framing it that way, rather than, well, God told me I'm going to go do this. Right? There's so much more humility. There's so much more need to be interconnected to others. And the outcomes are going to be so much healthier for so many more people when we pause and we allow others to inform what we believe God may or may not be leading, and doing, uh, leading us to do in our lives. Okay? Now, the way of living life well, living a good life, has already been revealed to us in the Bible, in the person and work of Jesus, in his words that are recorded for us. It's the clearest expression of the way that God wants you and I to live. A life of learning to follow in the way of Jesus. This is what discipleship means and is all about. And so as it is Christmas time, and as we're entering the season, let me remind us of what Jesus came to do that first Christmas. Let me read some words from the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter, where we read, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. This is what Jesus is inviting us to. This is what Jesus is calling us to. What might be your next courageous step of faith, just like Josiah took thousands of years ago?